In the year 673 CE, the Byzantine Empire, the last eastern remnant of the once mighty Roman Empire, faced annihilation. The armies of the Islamic Umayyad Caliphate, led by Caliph Mu'awiyah, had cut swaths through the territories of the Christian Empire, conquering North Africa, Sicily, Tarsus, and Rhodes in quick succession. They now set their sights on the capital of the empire itself, the ancient city of Constantinople. After capturing the nearby peninsula of Cyzicus, the Islamic forces settled in for a prolonged siege, sending fleets across the Sea of Marmara to attack the city. For the Byzantines, already weakened by war against the Sassanids of Persia, the situation seemed bleak. But then, three years into the siege in 678, a small Byzantine fleet sailed from Constantinople to face down the enemy fleet. The Arab sailors prepared for a conventional naval battle with catapults, archers, and boarding parties at the ready. But as soon as the Byzantine ships came into firing range, great jets of flame came shooting out of their bows as if from the mouths of dragons, dowsing the Arab ships stem to stern with liquid fire. The burning substance, which roared loudly as it streamed through the air, stuck fast to every surface it struck, instantly setting the ships ablaze and throwing up impenetrable clouds of black smoke. Those Arab sailors, not immediately burned alive, leapt into the sea in terror. But even those who did not drown still faced an agonizing death, for incredibly the mysterious substance burned even underwater and could not be put out. Faced with such a terrifying and devastating weapon, the Arab fleet was routed, the siege was broken, and the Byzantine Empire was saved. The Umayyads had just witnessed the awesome power of Greek fire, a powerful incendiary weapon that helped the Byzantine Empire fend off foreign invaders for nearly 800 years. But what actually was Greek fire? Who invented it? And why did it suddenly disappear from history? Before we get started with today's episode, I've got a fantastic tip for you. Have you ever wondered if you're getting the best deal online? Well, so did I. And that's where today's sponsor, NordVPN, comes in. Because they're not just keeping you safe online, they're going to save you money. You know how prices for the same products or services can vary depending on your location? Look, for instance, maybe you're booking a hotel room or buying a plane ticket. It could be more expensive if the website detects that you visited it before. You can be like, oh, hello. <laughs> You've been here before, haven't you? You must really want that ticket, so let's jack up the price, shall we? Well, NordVPN server selection allows you to bypass that. You can connect to a server somewhere else, and that website will just be like, I don't know who you are, you've never been here before yet, so you a good price, okay? You might just find that the prices magically drop. It's all like getting insider access to the best deals, no matter where you are. NordVPN is the most popular choice for a reason. With a single click, you get rock-solid internet security, protection from malware with threat protection, and you can even keep an eye on the dark web with their dark web monitor. But there's more. The mesh network allows you to connect to your devices securely from anywhere, plus their dedicated IP helps you bypass captures and block lists easily. And what I love most is that NordVPN is privacy oriented. They don't track or share your online activities and your data is always protected with strong encryption. You can even activate the kill switch to ensure that your data is never exposed. So don't wait, secure your online world with NordVPN. Just go to nordvpn.com forward slash T-I-F-O and get four extra months on a two year plan. It's risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. And now today's video. Now, incendiary weapons were nothing new by the time of the first siege of Constantinople. As early as the 9th century BCE, the Assyrians of ancient Mesopotamia were using flaming arrows and grenade-like clay jars filled with flammable substances to set fire to besieged cities. These incendiary compositions were likely made of petroleum products, which bubbled up from the grounds in natural seeps and formed deposits of solid bitumen. By the 7th century BCE, the Babylonians had figured out how to fractionally distill natural petroleum to produce crude naphthalene, kerosene, and tar, which was used for lighting, caulking ships, paving roads, and warfare. And in the 3rd century CE, Roman historian Sextus Julianus Africanus has a detailed description of an effective incendiary compound used by the Roman legions to quote, automatic fire also by the following formula. This is the recipe. Take equal amounts of sulfur, rock salt, ashes, thunderstone, and pyrite, and and pound fine in a black mortar at midday sun. Also in equal amounts of each ingredient, mix together black mulberry resin and zagnethian asphalt, the latter in a liquid form and free flowing, resulting in a product that is sooty colored. Then add to the asphalt the tiniest amount of quicklime. But because the sun is at its zenith, one must pound it carefully and protect the face, for it will ignite suddenly. When it catches fire, one should seal it in some sort of copper receptacle. In this way, you will have it available in a box without exposing it to the sun. If you should wish to ignite enemy armaments, you will smear it on in the evening, either on the armaments or some other object, but in secret. When the sun comes up, everything will be burnt up." End quote. 
As for Greek fire, this was a further refinement of these prior compositions, though it was to prove by far the most effective. The invention of Greek fire is typically attributed to one Kalinikos of Heliopolis, a Greek Jewish architect who fled to Constantinople in 672 following the Arab invasion of Phoenice in modern-day Syria. According to legend, Kalinikos tinkered for years to produce an effective incendiary weapon, which he then presented to the Byzantine Emperor Constantine IV. Constantine proclaimed Greek fire a gift from God, which was, quote, shown and revealed by an angel to the great and holy first Christian Emperor Constantine. The angel bound him not to prepare this fire, but for Christians and only in the imperial city. Constantine appeared to be vindicated when Kalinikos' weapon succeeded in routing the Islamic invaders in 678 and again in 717. In addition to the incendiary mixture itself, Kalinikos is also credited with creating a system for projecting it at the enemy, known as the Siphon. This consisted of a swiveling bronze nozzle mounted to the deck of a ship from which Greek fire could be sprayed in a similar fashion to a modern flamethrower. Often these nozzles were decorated with the heads of lions and other animals for further terrifying effect. Siphons were reported to have a range of 50 meters and were typically installed on Byzantine warships known as Dromon, fast galleys propelled either by sails or oars. Just how the siphon actually worked, however, is something of a mystery. One of the few contemporary accounts of the mechanism comes from the Wolfenbüttel manuscript. Quote, having built a furnace right at the front of the ship, they set on it a copper vessel full of these things having put fire underneath. And one of them, having made a bronze tube similar to that which the rustics call a squitty autora, squirt with which boys play, they spray it at the enemy. End quote. Another surviving account comes from the 11th century Viking saga of Ingvar the Far Traveled, who led an expedition into what is the modern day Republic of Georgia. Quote, they began blowing with Smith's bellows at a furnace in which there was fire, and there came from it a great din. There stood there also a brass or bronze tube, and from it flew much fire against one ship, and it burned up in a short time so that all of it became white ashes. Based on these and other contemporary descriptions, in 2006, historians John Haldeman and Maurice Byrne attempted to build a working replica for the Byzantine siphon for the National Geographic television program Machines Time Forgot. In their reconstruction, the Greek fire mixture, composed of natural petroleum mixed with a wood resin as a thickener, was preheated in an airtight tank by a brazier known as a propyron. This not only pre-pressurized the mixture, but also helped keep it liquid and raised it above its flash point, making it easier to ignite. Further pressurization was achieved using a hand-powered bronze pump. The preheated fluid was then conveyed through bronze pipes to a swivel-mounted nozzle or strepton, where it was expelled over a small oil flame to ignite it. Incredibly, the reconstruction exactly matched contemporary accounts, achieving an effective range of 15 meters and temperatures of over 1,000 degrees Celsius. These temperatures required the installation of iron shields to protect the operators, known in Byzantine times as Bocolia. Despite this, without more detailed historical sources, it's impossible to know whether Haldon and Byrne's design actually matched the historical siphon. What is known is that the naval siphon was not the only way the Byzantines deployed Greek fire. They also devised handheld projectors that were ancestors of modern man packed flamethrowers and poured the mixture into pottery, hand grenades, and catapult projectiles. Armed with these devastating secret weapons, the Byzantines succeeded in beating back dozens of enemies, both foreign and domestic. Greek fire was used to devastating effect by Emperors Romanos I and Constantine IX during the 941 and 1043 Rus Byzantine Wars, by John I Mises in Bulgaria in 972, Alexios I against the Pisans in 1099, and Basil II against rebel general Bardas Phocas in 987. One of the few historical visual representations of Greek fire in use comes from the 12th century Madrid Skylatzes illustrated manuscripts and depicts ships of Emperor Michael II fleet shooting flames at the forces of another rebel leader, Thomas the Slav, in the year 822. There was little these foes could do to protect themselves against Greek fire. The most common countermeasure, leather shields coated in vinegar, alum, and tar, was only marginally effective, while water was useless against the incendiary liquid, which could reportedly only be extinguished using a mixture of vinegar, sand, and old urine. Unsurprisingly, many other nations attempted to copy and deploy Greek fire, including the Bulgars and Arabs, though none managed to exactly recreate the original Byzantine formulation. It is the Arab version of the weapon which Western Christians first encountered during the Seventh Crusade in 1248, and the Crusaders themselves who gave it its modern name. Prior to this, Greek fire are commonly referred to as liquid fire, sea fire, manufactured fire, war fire, and Roman fire. Yet despite its vital role in defending the Byzantine Empire for nearly 800 years, all accounts of the original Greek fire's use and its exact 
compositions suddenly cease following the Fourth Crusade of 1204 when the Crusaders sacked Constantinople. One theory as to its sudden disappearance is that the weapon was banned by the Second Lateran Council of 1139 for being too destructive or inhumane. However, no such decree appears in any of the 30 canons exacted by the Council, and it is unlikely that such an effective weapon would have been prohibited for use against the Church's Islamic enemies. The more likely explanation is that the formula for Greek fire was simply lost in the violence and chaos of Constantinople's fall. This is supported by the fact that Greek fire was a closely guarded state secret, with Emperor Romanos II declaring in the mid-10th century that three things must never enter foreign lands, the Byzantine imperial regalia, any royal princess, and Greek fire. According to legend, the full recipe for Greek fire was known only to inventor Kalinikos of Heliopolis and his family, while its manufacture was highly compartmentalized so that no one workman could reveal the entire process if captured. Indeed, though the Bulgars captured several siphons and a large quantity of Greek fire in 814, they were never able to reverse engineer the weapon. This degree of secrecy and compartmentalization made the formula for Greek fire vulnerable to being lost, and this appears to be exactly what happened in 1204. So what exactly was Greek fire? Unfortunately, the few contemporary accounts of its formulation are frustratingly vague, with the most complete coming from the Alexiad by 12th century Byzantine chronicler Anna Komnene. This fire is made by the following arts. From the pine and certain such evergreen trees, inflammable resin is collected. This is rubbed with sulfur and put into tubes of reed, and is blown by men using it with violent and continuous breath. Then in this matter it meets the fire on the tip and catches light and falls like a fiery whirlwind on the faces of the enemies. Based on these and other partial descriptions, historians have speculated the Greek fire was composed of petroleum products like naphthalene and bitumen mixed with sulfur and various plant resins as thickeners. Potassium nitrate, also known as saltpeter, was also likely an ingredient as this produces oxygen as it burns and would account for Greek fire's legendary ability to burn underwater. Similarly, calcium oxide, aka quicklime, heats up rapidly when hydrated and would have made the mixture self-igniting on contact with water. But while these experimental mixtures have produced results nearly identical to contemporary accounts, without more concrete historical documentation, we cannot know for certain what the original Greek fire was really made of. For now, it remains a fascinating and tantalizing historical mystery.